we're going to give a, a chance for a few more people to uh, to enter the room. We have a bunch of registered uh, of registrations today, so we'll just let a a couple more people in. We'll start maybe in two minutes. Just give a, a chance for a few more people to uh, to enter the room we today. So we'll just let a. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Class and Sex Forms, featuring Professors Ramsey Fawaz from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Professor Paisley Karaf from CUNY's Brooklyn College, and also a former executive director of CLAG's the Center for LGBTQ Studies. I am Matt Brim, the current executor, executive director of CLAGS, and it's my pleasure to be moderating today's conversation, which is part of a programming series that we have at CLAGS um, that investigates queer class relations. Today, our panelists relate queer and transgender to class by thinking about form. The title of today's event is Class and Sex Forms. Uh, and so they're thinking about form, form meaning both the shapes by which queer creative culture is materially imagined, Ramsey, you can correct me if I'm wrong, and form in terms of the policies and regulatory documents or forms by which sex is not simply recorded, but made or done. Our overarching question for today is how can turning to form help us to consider queer and transgender class relations? Uh, this question is made possible by the brilliant scholarship of our two guests, Ramsey's book, Queer Forms, and Paisley's book, Sex Is As Sex Does. Uh, I'll introduce Ramsey and Paisley more fully in just a second, and then we'll have a conversation. Um, we'll have a chance to answer audience questions. So I want to encourage everybody in the audience to put your questions in the chat throughout. Um, but on with the introductions. Ramsey Fawaz is an award-winning queer cultural critic public speaker and educator. He is the author of two books, including Queer Forms from 2022, which we'll hear about today a bit, and also the 2016 The New Mutants, Superheroes and the Radical Imagination of American Comics, both published by NYU Press. Ramsey's popular writing on feminist and queer media, uh, media American cultural politics, and superhero comics regularly appears in the LA Review of Books, online channels avidly, and the Philosophical Salon. From 2019 to 20, uh, Fawaz was a Stanford Humanities Center Fellow, and he is currently a Romness Professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Ramsey, it is Clegg's pleasure to welcome you. Um, and it is also our pleasure to welcome Paisley Karaf, Professor of Political Science and Women's and Gender Studies at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Um, Kara has written widely on transgender issues, including on topics such as discrimination, sex reclassification, and the transgender rights movement. From 2014 to 19, he co-edited the leading journal in transgender studies, TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly, and Kara's book, Sex Is As Sex Does, Governing Transgender Identity, was released in 2022 also by New York University Press. Um, 
Paisley, it is our pleasure to welcome you to CLAGS, back to CLAGS. <laughs> um, and so I think before we, we get to sort of the main question of today, how can turning to form help us consider queer and transgender class relations, it would be helpful if each of you in turn um, gave us a thumbnail sketch of your book. Uh, and so maybe Ramsey, we'll start with you and Queer Forms. Can you tell us what this book is about and what maybe um, how you define forms in the book and sort of its parameters? And then Paisley, I'll ask you to do the same. Absolutely. And before I start, I just want to say what a gift it is to be here. I'm only sad that I can't see Paisley and Matt in person, but I'm so delighted to have this conversation and to share these ideas. Uh, Paisley's book transformed my life in the last year and a half, and I'm so glad to be having this conversation. Um, Queer Forms is a study of the ways in which movements for gender and sexual freedom in the 1970s inspired a vast range of creative producers, writers, filmmakers, visual artists, uh, among others, to invent new formal and aesthetic ways of representing gender and sexual nonconformity. So if movements for women's and gay liberation in the late 60s and 70s began to expansively imagine how gender and sexual dissidents could enter the public sphere, have an impact on American politics, change the culture, creative producers were frantically and kind of imaginatively trying to create different forms, figures, imagine like imaginative icons in the mind's eye of what that looks like. What does it look like to be gender and sexual non-conforming in everyday life? I wrote the book out of my frustration that contemporary queer and trans politics often have a view of radical feminism from the 70s as extraordinarily retrograde, white, racist, transphobic, when in fact most of our uh, most amazing ideas about gender and sexual rebellion today emerge out of women's radical refusal of the gendered social order of post-war America. And that at the same time that feminists were inventing many of those ideas, they were being impacted and influenced by queer people of many stripes, including trans folks, who were telling them you can have an even more expansive view of what gender and sexual freedom looks like. I found that that history of mutual influence between feminism and gay liberation could be most visibly seen in cultural production, in movies, in literature, in theater, because many of the writers and creators of those objects didn't really care about the ideological purity of different political movements. They mixed and matched, they borrowed from trans politics, they borrowed from queer politics, they borrowed from feminist politics, and they created imaginative science fictional artistic worlds for imagining what it would look like if we drew upon all of the various resources of gender and sexual freedom. So the last thing that I'll say is that while I do this long study of the 1970s, looking at various objects from serial gay fiction like Tales of the City, uh, films like The Boys in the Band, and lesbian science fiction um, like Born in Flames, uh, I also provide a meta critique of queer and feminist studies today. I question the kind of obsessive focus on notions of gender and sexual fluidity as the pinnacle of all forms of liberation for gender and sexual non-conforming people. I say that in a deep irony or paradox, fluidity often backfires. It becomes, rather than being a form of flexibility or open-endedness, it becomes almost like a religious or spiritual orthodoxy, where we argue that everybody must be fluid, everybody must be fluid in the same way, when in fact, change and transformation tends to be slow and clunky. Most of us do not have identities that are liquid or that can deliquesce. And in fact, when, when our identities come under that much pressure, we feel mentally scattered and overwhelmed. And I argue that form, thinking about cultural form is one way of cohering different kinds of gender and sexual identities without making them fixed or universal, but simply proliferating different forms that we can inhabit. So that's kind of a nutshell of the, of the whole book. Ramsey, teach me a new word. Did you say deliquesce? 
<laughs> yes, to like liquefy or melt. <laughs> did yeah. you know that word before you wrote this book? <laughs> I did. I only knew it because I had to describe a, an image from an amazing comic book in which a gay man, because of his lost love, eats a bowl of ice cream and then melts into it. And I had to describe him as deliquescing into his ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ramsey. And uh, Paisley, we'll turn to you with the same question. All right. Well, thank you so much, Matt. I'm really delighted to be back at Clags and in conversation with Ramsey and you and the audience. And um, this is such a great book. I love this book. Also, this book, I hope you all have poor career studies. We can hopefully talk about all, all of these books today. Um, so my book kind of be began with a problem. I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about this woman who testified at a testified in New York City when I was working on a trans rights bill like 20 years ago and this woman came up and testified and she said I do not suffer from gender dysphoria I suffer from bureaucratic dysphoria my identity my doc my identity document does not match my appearance I worry every time I apply for a credit card every time I go through a security check etc cetera, etc cetera. and so I was interested in this kind of disjunction between the individual and the state as a matter of recognition. So I started with that and I thought, okay, I'm going to just focus on this question of sex classification. And then speaking about forms, I started like keeping track of all the policies. You know, I'm trained as a political theory. I have no political theorist. I have no real empirical abilities, but I had this huge, crazy Excel sheet of every sex classification policy I could find in the United States in every state, every agency, in every state, every decision. And there's just so many contradictions. Like the same, the idea that, that one person could be both male and female in the eyes of the state, it kind of was like, it seems crazy. Like how I, how could I be male at the driver's license bureau and female in prison, et cetera, or male at a homeless shelter and then, you know, female um, on my birth certificate. So I began kind of investigating that and I was trying to unlock some magical key <laughs> And then I realized as I was working through this, like the problem was me thinking that like thinking of myself because I went to the center of my own universe. The problem is thinking like I exist in some kind of incoherent ent entity in the eyes of the state. Like I was thinking of myself as one thing and the state as one thing. And in fact, there's no unitary thing that is the state. There are all these different agencies and and um, that have, have their own particular uh, missions and are backed by particular forces of law that do different things. And once I sort of unpacked that, I was able to kind of, I was able to stop thinking about transgender people for once and actually stop thinking about myself and think instead about what states are doing. Because what this book tries to do is like, okay, there's so much sophistication on gender and sex, blah, there's so much. No one, no one needed another book on that. But I felt like in queer and trans studies, there was just like a mismatch between our, our theoretical sophistication on gender and sexuality studies and our understanding of the state, our understanding of markets. So what this book does is kind of like doesn't focus so much. It talks a little. We can talk a little bit of the identity politics stuff, but it focuses more on like how sex itself, as in one's whether one's male or female, is actually a technology of government, and it can change depending on. Um, what what this what particular state agency is doing so running through the book is a critique of or not a critique but a you know kind of with a friendly critique i hope of a certain kind of transgender identity politics narrative that kind of places transgender rights movement in this tradition of the movement from african-american civil rights the gay, gay rights movement women's rights movement. And it kind of, what I try to do in the book is kind of unpack that a little bit. And one thing I do is kind of, and I'm, I'm so glad to be in this pen, pen with Ramsey today because of the kind of work he does is like, I kind of actually point to the fact that transgender rights, as we call them, have a, a huge debt to the boring old uncool second wave liberal feminism. <laughs> like the fact that like sex classification policies are baked into our state architecture is because states use gender distributed resources. So as boring old second wave feminism got the state out of the business of um, treating men and women differently and gender becomes decommissioned, it becomes more possible for transgender people to change their rules governing sex classification. So um, I could talk more about, you know, in the conversation about like where we can kind of see these debates, but I do think at this particular political moment, we really need to, to attend to 
the kind of the the the, the class aspects of queer and trans movements and also the kind of the way in which some aspects of LGBT politics, queer politics, and trans politics does a very good job of making tr class invisible. Um, and I think um, I was just following this um, this kind of mainstream political analysis uh, analyst I sort of like on Twitter. I, his name is something I can't pronounce. His actual name is Joshua Cohn. And he pointed out that, um, you know, if Biden loses, they're going to like look for a scapegoat and it's probably going to be transgender people. You know, in terms of like, look what happened. We weren't paying attention to the needs of working class people. We just paid attention to bathrooms, which they tried in 2016. So we really have to kind of sharpen our analytical thinking and come up with better explanations of like the creation of queer and, and, and trans politics that doesn't just rely, like Ramsey, Ramsey was saying, on some suggestion that like if you're kind of queer or trans, you're the vanguard of some sort of revolutionary fluid thing, because that's not necessarily true. We need to kind of like unpack the assumptions that go into that kind of conflation of a queer politics or a trans politics with the radical kind of class-based politics. So I'll I'll stop there, but I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Ramsey, uh, sorry, Paisley, I'll ask a follow-up question and then Ramsey, you can pop in. How, and this is for both of you, how, um, how conscious of class were you as you wrote the book? Well, I would, you know, I, I don't know if I should talk like this, but like, you know, you think you're supposed to be coming from these kind of scholarly areas and thinking about this or that. I was sort of coming from being inside the transgender rights movement, um, but also hanging around with a lot of like Brooklyn lefty people who I really like their work, but were also sort of oblivious to trans stuff and sort of thought it was just identity politics. So my book is sort of like trying to like, be, be the, in, comes out of the interstices of like of those kind of invisibilities on both sides. So I was so I was trying to do kind of a a class based critique of identity politics that didn't cede all the ground to those bearded Williamsburg dudes who never who go into a bar with their driver's license and have never thought once in their in their life about how it's like a privilege to be able to have the right gender on your driver's license. So I didn't want to like just agree with their critique, but I certainly and I wanted to kind of you know, bring those two schools together. Classic. <laughs> um, in a lot of ways, I wasn't actually conscious of class at all. I think, you know, my, in, initially, because my work is very utopian, it's very reparative, and I have spent a lot of my career pushing back against the classical Marxist ideological reading of popular culture that does this kind of like top-down reading that says popular culture is a product of mass corporate machinery. It always pushes forward an ideological agenda from the top, from the elite, right? And I am wanting to show how popular culture often exceeds the class origins from which it comes from because it circulates widely. It finds surprising audiences. People do amazing, unusual things with it. So my initial thing was like, I actually want to deracinate I want to like separate queer and feminist popular culture from a kind of top down reading that says this is really all the product of a bunch of like rich, white, gay and feminist people. What amazed me in the process of writing the project was to realize that the realm of culture as a scene where various political actors were trying to figure out like what gender and sexual nonconformity could look like brought people across class together constantly. So like early second wave feminism is a deeply cross-class phenomenon. You know, when John F. Kennedy puts together the commission on the status of women, he brings together people from Eleanor Roosevelt all the way to like educators who are working in the rural South. He's bringing together women from all across the country in lots of different arenas, different races, different classes, different life experiences. And they're debating what this what the category of woman is going to be when we think about women as so heterogeneous economically, socially, et cetera. Similarly, gay liberation was a project that was totally from the ground up, that was mostly initiated by young people who had kind of separated themselves from the trappings of middle-class life in order to live like on pennies in New York City and produce art and be around their friends. But there were a lot of middle-class people who also used the resources at their disposal to be able to live a bohemian life. 
will, like knowing that they would be protected by their family wealth, et cetera, all those people were in conversation. They were producing art, they were writing novels. So you get somebody like Ira Levin, who is like a Jewish intellectual upper middle class guy who's made a lot of money off of his writing and which have been adapted into movies, writing The Stepford Wives. And then you have someone like Lizzie Borden producing a lesbian science fiction movie that is all in tandem with working class uh, black lesbians and Latinx lesbians and Asian lesbians, right? So the field of culture became this amazing place for cross-class interaction but it's sort of similar to what Samuel Delaney describes, like in the realm of like sex and eroticism in New York City. And I became really amazed about that sharing of experience. Um, and so that's one dimension of where class started to enter in as I finished the book. And I, I have more to say about that. But yeah. I mean, I, I just want to ask a further question about that, Ramsey, because, you know, you are one of these thinkers. And, and what I think about you as a writer and thinker and scholar um is that you truly believe in the potential of popular culture or art literature to change people in a fundamental yeah. way. That is imaginable to you. Absolutely. <laughs> and, it's happened and, to me. That's the thing is like, I know it because it's happened to me many times. Uh huh. But the, so the thing that's curious about that to me is, or, or, and I don't know if you consider yourself utopian, but you certainly can. You certainly think about the the power of art to change to change people. And what I found compelling about the answer that that you just gave is you don't believe that because you want to. <laughs> you you don't believe that because that's an attractive idea. In other words, you don't aspire to that vision. It sounds like you actually, in the research, saw a, a vision came together for you that you that 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 made you a believer absolutely i think that's totally right listen i mean i often don't say i'm a utopian because i'm actually very pragmatic it's just that i'm a pragmatic optimist like i think history basically shows us that people change the conditions of their existence all the time and people also live in hell for long periods of time so like anything is possible i mean uh paisley will appreciate i mean i'm very much in some ways a political theorist in the guise of a cultural studies scholar. And my work is very influenced by the thinking of Hannah Arendt, right? The, one of the greatest political theorists of the 20th century who said like the only thing that's universally true about the world is plurality and diversity and the unpredictability of the political field, that anything can happen. Like the world might end and we might destroy it and we also might not, like anything is possible. To me, culture is the playground where people try to work out ideas that can then be imaginatively worked through so they can be brought to everyday life. I don't think, I agree with Linda Zarilli, feminist political theorist, who says people don't want to free themselves because they get a picture of their trauma. It's rather that people who are living under oppression see a figure of freedom somewhere in the culture. It wasn't that women in the 50s suddenly realized that they were all traumatized. It was they actually saw some women going into the workforce. They saw some women choosing not to have children. And they suddenly were like, I didn't know I was oppressed until I saw someone doing something different. Then they became very aware of their trauma. Much of our politics is obsessed with focusing on the trauma, the loss, the woundedness, the injury. We forget that culture offers us pictures of what freedom looks like before we can figure out what the injury is, right? That's why so many queer people are all, like the first notion of self-actualization of any queer person is like, I saw myself somewhere, or like I saw an image of somebody behaving in a way that I didn't know was possible, you know? And so for me, what I learned in the research is that through sustained, meaningful interaction with culture, that is not merely about consuming it, but actually interpreting it, people change. When I studied Tales of the City and its circulation in 1970s San Francisco, it wasn't simply that people read a story in the paper about queer people and their sex lives. It was that they were constantly talking about it with others. They were engaged in dialogic interactions with people, their neighbors, people on the bus. They were doing what we do in literature classrooms in everyday life. 
they were interpreting in public and that refined their political sensibility. So one of the people that I interviewed who read Tales of the City said, to the political activist, Paula Lichtenberg. And she said to me, I can't prove it, but I almost feel certain that people voted down the Briggs Initiative in San Francisco, partly because they had read Tales of the City, because they had encountered gay characters for so long in the paper that even if they didn't know gay people, they liked those people and they did not want to politically vote against them. So to me, it's culture alone is not a sufficient, um, it's not a sufficient uh, thing to change the world. It doesn't dismantle structural hierarchy. It doesn't change the equitableness of the resources, but it is a necessary, it's like necessary, but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And so I'm invested in that necessary part. And because I see that I'm humble about it. I don't think it's gonna transform everything, but I think we have to have it. Paisley, I don't know if you want to jump in right away, but there's a related question in your book. And that is, there's a, you at one point say something like, you know, who better than transgender people right now to stand out as the symbol of identity? And you note that, and you very much want to shift away and not think about transgender people as a discrete community to whom, though, of course, many harms are done. Your analysis does not pursue the transgender people as a a uh, a harmed minority community uh and there's a even though obviously you 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 recognize that the you know violence is done to, to trans people and so there's a risk in making the shift that you do from thinking about people and this is a, a risk that i think maybe ramsey you confront too but paisley uh, there's a shift there's a risk in shifting from thinking about harmed people to thinking about the policies and documents that create the conditions under which sex actually is defined and done, which is your focus. And how do you how do you wrestle with, with that? I, I'm calling it a risk. Maybe you don't think it is a risk, but how do you wrestle with that reorientation? Yeah, that's a I'm like, yeah, I'm not muted. That's a really good question. And I kind of get to it, I think, in the in the chapter. On incarceration, and I look at the work that trans does to kind of like kind of universalize the risk in trans communities. So, like, you know, I go speak at an unnamed exclusive liberal arts college, and a young person stands up who seems white and talks about their their risk of incar incarceration. And in my head, I'm thinking your risk is getting us hired by Goldman Sachs. That's more of a risk that you're facing, I think. And, you know, so the idea that, like, since we're all trans, we are, like, likely to be poor and vulnerable and at a risk of incarceration, that is just not true. I'm a tenured full professor. Like, I could probably, like, murder someone and go to jail, but I might even lose tenure. I mean, you know, I'm, so I mean, I'm just saying, like, the risks are very different. So I, I do like to use the word trans to kind of, pay attention to kind of like the work it does to kind of make things invisible. So one example would be in looking at comparing trans prisoners to non-trans prisoners. And I understand why advocates do that. But what that does is it kind of asserts a kind of continuity between trans prisoners and trans people who are not incarcerated. And it asserts a difference between trans people who are incar incarcerated and cisgender people who are incarcerated. And certainly trans incarcerated people suffer great harms. And I talk about that. And I think it's important to talk about that. But that it's much more localized in terms of their position in racial and class hierarchies. And it also does this kind of exceptionalizing thing that if we didn't, if we didn't have discrimination against trans people, we wouldn't have this kind of downward spiral into the prisons where people are forced to go because they have to do survival, undergrad economy stuff, and they end up in prison. Um, and it also so kind of it kind of lumps up the kind of neoliberal regime, and then it also kind of implicitly suggests that like cisgender prisoners are doing fine, you know. And I've had like D. Farmers come speak at Brooklyn College, and she's the first trans person to have a case before the Supreme Court. Many people don't have never heard of her because they think of Amy Stevens in Bostock, but in 1994. Well, for years, uh, D. Farmer litigated her own Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual punishment case. When it got to the, when the Supreme Court accepted it, 
Only then did the ACLU jump in and say, oh, we'll defend you in court. But she litigated herself. She's a self-taught lawyer. And she spends her time now, she's been released, um, going around talking about not the plight of trans prisoners, but the plight of prisoners, right? So like trans prisoners are often denied medical care, gender affirming medical care. And cis, and but when cisgender prisoners have a serious medical issue, they get ibuprofen. So it's it's like we, we so I just like the work that trans does, I think, in that kind of context, does this thing of kind of obscuring class and race differences that that um that really matter. But another thing I say, just to kind of put my book in context, is like not that you shouldn't all get it. You should all go off and buy it so I can earn my, you know, 84 cents. But you can also, I'm sure, find it online in a PDF. Um, but it's really geared towards like a kind of left neoliberalism, right? A sort of kind of representative neoliberalism of the, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, variety or the the um, Biden variety, which is like, we'll make every, we'll, we'll give some people kind of little gifts like through formal recognition, but the, there'll be no fundamental... Um, changes to like the large structural inequalities. So it's not really geared towards looking at what's happening now, which is what I'm with the Republican anti-trans legislation, which is actually in intended to harm all trans people. So like there's been a shift and that um, we can, and we can talk about that more. I just want to say that this is one of my favorite aspects of Paisley's work. I mean, that's what I love is that Paisley is able to do two things at once that we need to be doing much better in queer trans feminist politics, which is to acknowledge the specificity of different groups okay. of gender and sexual nonconforming people, and then recognizing that their interests are deeply tied and wedded to other constituencies, and that we we share certain experiences that move across many many variables of experience and like something i read about in queer forms is that there has never been a single radical identity movement since the 50s that has not at some point or another succumbed to the lure of exceptionalizing its own difference as the most radical, the most abject, the most important. Not one, not Black civil rights, which became Black power, not lesbian feminism, you know, not trans politics. The, the turn in contemporary queer feminist and trans studies, mostly in queer and trans studies and Black studies, actually, to ontological claims about Afro-pessimism, about black objection, about trans, you know, transness being like, you know, Marquis Bay's quote, it says that it's like an unoriginal lawlessness. These are attempts to turn lived categories into universal, like, forms of abjection. It's just, everyone does that. Like, I want to remind people, like, history shows us that everyone does it and it always fails. Because no group of people is ever coherent nor can represent any aspect of the human condition unconditionally or universally. It doesn't make sense. So like, I love that Paisley's work basically questions that move and says it is possible to simultaneously acknowledge that we live in a historical moment where a certain group of people who think of themselves as trans identified have certain needs, but those needs will change over time and they are part of a larger human experience where their interests also are coterminants with the interests of other people. I'm very quickly going to open a ridiculous can of worms that I apologize for in advance, trigger warning. But like the person I keep thinking about when I have these debates is J.K. Rowling. Because when I listen to her, this is a person who's become obsessed with the idea that one group of people, what she thinks of as cis women, is the most abused, is the most mistreated. And when I listen to her, I'm like, but what you seem to be railing against is a culture of abuse. Like, why do you keep talking only about women? Like, you seem to be railing against the idea that people are abused in this society. Well, guess what? Women abuse other women. Men abuse other men. Trans people abuse each other. Like, every combination of abuse exists. So why are you so worried only about one group? And her answer is always like, well, statistically speaking... They make up whatever. And I'm like, that can still be true. And other people can also be abused. So again, it's like, 
that falling back on group identification always leads to a nightmare. It always leads to separating oneself from larger constituencies of people. And I think we have to be very, very wary of that because we end up reproducing it even as we claim that we hate it in other people. Do, do you all, Ramsey and Paisley, do you think that it's that we are, scholars, people are bad at handling the contradictions, right? Or that we don't see all the contradictions because sometimes it's very difficult, like reading, reading your book, Paisley, like all of the different possibilities for mismatches between two government agencies at any one place, like almost from like neighborhood to neighborhood can be insane, but you would, it'd be very hard to see. Your, your spreadsheet must be huge, right? <laughs> he said, um, or, or Ramsey, is it that we're not very good at looking at, looking at all these forms that were created? And seeing them contest each other in this way that you find really productive is it is it we're not good at theorizing contradiction and messiness, or that we have other motivations for saying for streamlining, you know, beyond the contradictions? Well, I can jump in. I mean, I think that's a really good question. I think messiness is hard because, like, I always want to like you know, come in as a political theorist and I, I really kind of want to tie things up in a really neat, neat, neat little bow. And like, it, it's always good to remember, to remember, like, that's not the answer. Like, that's that's the problem. So I think we're not good at theorizing contradictions. Um, but I also think there's a certain kind of like desire to kind of set something out. Like this is, this group of people, um, there's something about them that is going to kind of dismantle the system, you know? And I had this, a uh, young political theorist who I really, whose work is really great, Joanna Woost, uh, she commented on the book and her whole dissertation was about identity narratives and LGBT politics and ontological claims of immutability. And so I was really pleased when she could say, I read the whole book and I couldn't find one ontological claim anywhere in the book, you know? Because <laughs> my, 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 what I kind of think is that there's all these, you know, there's all these trans 101 and intersex 101 and, explanations of like there's always been transgender people or transgender people exist because in every culture there's all these there's all these kind of foundational claims or like transgender people like it's about it's about really about gender norms or it's about uh some biological characteristic but from whatever school you're coming from there's all these kind of claims of what sex and gender really are and my larger point is that like we need to let go of the, that. Like, why does it matter? Like, here's a group of people who exist, who have needs. As Ramsey pointed out, our needs aren't really necessarily met. I mean, it's a necessary condition to be able to have the right gender on your identity document if, if everybody's going to have gender on their identity documents. That's a necessary condition for for living, you know, living in this world. But the the thing that we all really need is like these, like, you know, health care for everyone, prison abolition, you know, Funded public higher education, attacks on income inequality, um, but there there is this weird desire for this thing, you know, queer or trans is like especially disruptive or especially especially radical, and that like kind of like I'm happy to be in the cool crowd for like five seconds because I feel like I you know I was a political scientist when queer theory was cool, like I've never been the cool club, so <laughs> with trans, you know, I sort of am, but like. It's just it's just a it's a problem to kind of um that, that when people think of trans or queer as like the vanguard or the index our value to our ability to break down the gender binary, like our value should be just indexed by ourselves. Like and if like if we don't break down the gender binary, that means oh, we'll just throw those people away. So I just feel like it's a very scary position where some people kind of take on trans or queer issues because they think they do something else. Like we might want to break down the gender binary heteronormativity because that's our politics, you know, but it's not something that like it should be incumbent on a particular group of people to do. Ramsey, do you think this is, Paisley's making me think um, that this is a mature perspective that you have, that if I was a scholar at the beginning of my career, if I was a grad student, I could hear what you're saying, Paisley, um, I can hear what you're saying, Ramsey, but I might not feel it. I might not be tired enough of queer theory. I might not 
have run around the track enough until I'm exhausted and think want something else. I might not have just read enough so that you see, oh, look, everybody is saying this. I see patterns where everybody repeats these same mistakes or, you know, so it, it, how, how much of a vision that you all have is, is, is simply because you've been around a little bit, hey, uh, Ramsey, not as long around as long as we have been, but uh, better around. This is the at least your second book, getting there. <laughs> getting there. Yeah, so what do you think this question of sort of an intellectual maturity? I can I I love this question and I, I want to tie it to what you asked before. I'm gonna say I'm not a cynic. I'm such a deep optimist, but I am cynical about this. I do think the inter I'm all my new work in on the psychedelic renaissance is a critique of the interdisciplines. And I think the interdisciplines need to get their head out of their ass. I think the fields have an extraordinary will to power. And I think people in black studies, in queer studies, in Feminist theory in ethnic studies are doing some incredible work, but a lot of the work is really about circulating buzzwords and not illuminating anything about the actual world that we live in. And what's happened to me is it's not, it is partly a maturing that I have become exhausted of certain ideas, but it's always that I've been an iconoclast. Like I've never read scholarship and been like, I need to do exactly that. I didn't, when I was in grad school, I read work that was about to become super famous. I read terrorist assemblages, no future in a queer time and place, queer phenomenology, cruising utopia. These are books that now are hagiographic. People don't treat them like scholarship or ideas to argue with. They treat them like they're orthodoxy, like they're the Bible. And I'm like, those books are brilliant. And they also say a lot of things about the world that make no sense or that do not comport with how people actually live. You know, I look back at terrorist assemblages. That is a book that I love. I think it's really brilliant in some ways. And in some ways I can't stand that book because the book makes its argument so strongly that it can't even acknowledge the idea that Islam can be sexist. It wants to critique the idea of the critique of the Middle East so aggressively that there's no space for actually critiquing the Middle East. So like, I look at these books and I think that they're ground clearing gestures. They're so smart in their own way, but they're limited. And so we have to be willing as intellects, as a gesture of loving those books, we have to be willing to disagree with some of them, right? In a spirit of good faith. And I think I really am frustrated that much of the work I read in queer and black studies and trans studies has no transferable knowledge to me today. It circulates things that people are saying over and over and over again. And I, that frustrates me as a scholar because I'm not learning as much as I want to learn. So yeah, I mean, in many ways, queer forms is an effect of me looking at those, that work and saying, but I want to learn something from this past. What does it have to teach me? What's interesting is that, um, uh, Jazz Beer, of course, is a uh, Clags Kessler Award winner and has uh, has talked about um, terrorist assemblages and homonationalism having a, a real value and use in a time and place, but has recently said, you know, why are people clinging to this? You know, why are, yeah. you know and, 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 and you do see people say this every once in a while of those iconic books, right? Or, you know, every once in a while, somebody wants to, to tie Butler down to, you know, 1990, you know, like, it's not 1990. Um, and so even even like some of these, you know, these these scholars who's who still get cited for that early work move away from it. And there's sort of yeah. it's difficult to grasp that movement away from oneself, especially as you're coming into the field and sort of just saying hi to the people for the first time in their early work. Let me ask a, a, another class question. Um, and Paisley, I'll ask you about the the contradictions in around sex. Um, I wonder if 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 those are also um, those reflect or are imbricated with contradictions around class, um, or did you see class contradictions? Because you know, what is class if not a contradiction? You know, the contradiction of of you know the the bootstrap narrative. Apparently, Horatio Alger was a rich guy. I didn't know this, but um, <laughs> there's this boot bootstrap that that debunks all of these myths of the pull yourself up by your bootstraps. In all of those stories, those people are actually well off. <laughs> so it's weird. Um, but do you see class contradictions operating Paisley um, behind, in some way, the, the sex contradictions? 
Well, there's like a way in which like it's funny because ultimately I want to talk about political economy and if I want to grow up and be Melinda Cooper, you know, someday that will be nice if that could happen. But like I get stuck talking about the law because it's kind of like this kind of hermeneutically sealed closed universe and you can kind of do readings and it's really kind of actually easier than to kind of go through like economic data from centuries, you know. Um, so I think like what happens is there's a couple of things that happen. Like one thing is like legal categories that we have, we have intersectionality, we have race and gender, but like we, class is not an actionable category in the law, right? Like you, you can't say my class status has prevented me from um, being treated uh, fairly. So for example, when we were working at um, working on changing the New York City birth certificates, this is like a long time ago with Dean Spade and some transgender health advocates, and we wanted to point out to the government, the New York City government, that like if they made if they continue to keep surgery as a requirement for people changing their birth certificate, that would effectively make gender all about class. And we just just raised that once and we're like, no, no, we can't hear that. You can't, that's not an argument that we can talk about. We're talking only about sex or gender. Like there was literally like it wasn't unintelligible, but it was literally, literally off the table in discussions about what the requirements for like, uh, or what the metrics for sex reclassification would be. So in terms of like what um, policy studies people call administrative burden, that is always borne heavily uh, uh, by people who are poor by, yeah. and by the working class in terms of figuring out how to do all the forms, paying the fees, getting doctor's letters and affidavits. So there's lots of ways in, in, in which um, in which it's um, mediated. But there's another another way that kind of brings in class in a slightly different way that that um, I just mentioned it briefly, but you know, there's this long, this is like recurring debate. It never goes away. You wish it would about like distribution and recognition, you know, and trans people as I think you were refer alluding to it earlier, Matt, sometimes trans people are seen as like, the reductio ad, ad absurdum of the recognition category, like just these people who walk around and they just want to get recognition for their gender on their identity documents and use the bathroom. And it's it's not really distributive at all. But when I was going back to my crazy Excel sheet of all the all the different policies, eventually I saw a little bit of a pattern. Eventually I could see there were contradictions, but the contradictions made sense in, sense in some sense. So people could have their gender identity, were more likely to have their gender identity recognized by driver's license bureaus. And I used to think, oh, it's because DMV people are not homophobic or transphobic. <laughs> That's too simple. The reason why DMVs will let people change their driver's license relatively easily, because it's in the interest of the state in its project of surveillance for you to change your driver's license. So it's not like they're being nice to transgender people, though it's, it's a good effect, but it's because it's in the state interest. But there are all these decisions around marriage where trans people who have changed all their identity documents and then before Obergefell had the status of their marriage challenged by a, by a spouse or, or, or someone, they would always lose, like in almost every case but one. And the one case where they won was back in the 70s, would always lose at the appellate level because marriage is actually distributive in terms of like mm -hmm. marriage is this instrument for, you know, channeling property from one generation to the other. And so trans people kind of like were cut out of the, that distributive stuff. Because you look at the marriage cases, they were always about either about access to children or often property. So there's so there's ways in which kind of class um class definitely kind of plays in it plays into it. I want to encourage uh the audience to put your questions in the question and answer box wherever you find that on Zoom. There is one uh rather than in the chat. Sorry for those bad instructions. And I also want to encourage um especially uh graduate students if they're undergrads, but graduate students or really early career professionals to sort of weigh in with your questions or even your experiences. Um but the three of us would be happy to talk about uh, sort of the the profession as well, coming from our different places. I'm going to read a couple questions from uh, the Q and A. One is for Paisley, and one is for Ramsey. I'll read them both. Um, Paisley, in your this is from Grace Halverson. Paisley, in your research, did you encounter instances uh, in which government identity, form, control intersected with nation building, specifically through migration processes? 
In other words, perhaps queer migrants being more highly policed at TSA or other agencies due to their physical appearance not matching their identification documents. And Ramsey, the question for you is, this is from an anonymous attendee, what new things might you want to learn that queer theory hasn't taught us yet? Small question. Where do you see the learning lesson blind spots in the field? That's a great question. Um, yeah. Who wants to start? Doesn't make any difference. Why don't you go first, Ramsey? You, okay, I love, love, love this question. Thank you. And in fact, it is me trying to answer this question for myself that led me to start writing a book about psychedelics and the study of literature and culture. Um, number one, queer studies needs to get much better at explaining how people change. We are so obsessed with describing how racist and transphobic and homophobic people we are people are. But if we actually believe in transformative politics, then we must think that people can change that people can become less racist, less homophobic. We need to actually study the historical occurrences of where that took place, yeah. how it happens. When I did interviews of people who read Tales of the City in the 1970s, just doing 30 interviews with real people who read a queer text in a public space allowed me to show how they became less homophobic, less transphobic. Some of them weren't really transphobic. They became more expansive about their ideas about transness. Being able to actually show historically how that happens is something you cannot do with random theoretical concepts like fugitivity, like Afro-pessimism. Like you can't explain those things without doing really deep research. That's like number one. Number two, we need to study a much broader range of affects. A lot of my work on psychedelics, I talk about how the interdisciplines are obsessed with negativity. There's a million books about cruel optimism, disaffected, you know, feeling trans and feeling bad. I cannot fully absorb the fact that people who are professors at universities are always in a bad mood. Like, <laughs> like the only thing we can study is negative affect as though that that's always the, like the people I see who are writing those books seem to be having a ball. They're going to parties at conferences and traveling the world and giving talks and getting job offers everywhere. I'm like, I don't care about how disaffected you are. Like, tell me about the history of an emotion and about how it plays out. Like, the range of the human sensorium is wide. It is neither only negative nor positive. We don't need to always be a disaffected or queer optimism, Black joy. Like, opening out the entire range of the sensorium, telling its complex history among queer, trans, and feminist people is key. And a third thing, which doesn't exhaust the list, but just to give up tie this up with a bow is like we need to study how people actually do coalition i also do not need another book about how white women suck and about how white people suck everybody who writes those books is best friends with white people having sex with them they're your girlfriends and boyfriends like i'm so bored of hearing the same story about how like this one group of people excludes these other people are radical talk about how people figured out ways to work together across many different differences to like do something in the world. I wanna show how people actually made something happen. So those are three things that I would like to learn more from the interdisciplines and queer and feminist trans studies. I'm so sorry you didn't have an answer for that at hand, Rams. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so Basically, what do you got? This is such a great panel. Well, it's not gonna be as smart <laughs> as that. Uh, but Grace, that is a really good question. I didn't look specifically at migration, though that would be an area that it would be great if someone did. But definitely there's like stuff around nation building in the in like the institution of marriage. So I have I have a chapter that's not in the book. It was supposed to be in the book. And then the book was, you know, I didn't want it to be long and I never could kind of finish it off. And I'd be happy to send it to people. But it's about um, it's just it kind of looks at these cases where there's these kind of famous cases from the 70s where like this guy in California, Gerald, his wife has a baby and. Um, in English common law and in, you know, which get, get, gets incorporated into American common law, the father, you know, the husband is the father. Blackstone says, unless he be out of the kingdom, the husband is always the father, you know, um, just for domestic peace and tranquility. And by domestic, he meant the household. So so it's always been a tradition in common law and American law now that the, your husband is kind of automatically the father. So this guy, Gerald, this cisgender man, was married. And then this guy, Michael, comes along and says, actually, I'm the father. And then it goes to the Supreme Court and they hear back and forth. They said, yeah, we're going to go with Gerald because it's better for, you know, husbands to be the fathers. So that was kind of settled case laws. 
case law. Uh, and then so like trans men who are married and then get divorced, uh, their advocates thought that case law would work for them because they were married. And they, why couldn't they also be the father? Because Gerald, the guy in California, would, he wasn't literally the biological father. But the courts really intervene and they say, no, that's not going to happen. And I think the reason why it's not going to happen is because with Gerald, Gerald, this is Clang, so I can say whatever I want. So Gerald, like, had a penis. It worked. You know, there was no suggestion of infertility, right? But trans men don't have this kind of alibi of the penis to suggest that the family is this kind of biological unit. So the family we know from Blackstone and everybody else is like this social social formation that pretends to be a biological formation traveling through history, right? And so trans men kind of mess that up. And so in this this chapter that I got to publish sometime, um, I kind of kind of talk with that in terms of nation building and how married the whole point of marriage policy is to organize na people's people into nations is all, you know, drawing on Nancy F. Cotton, people like it's all about whiteness and ethnicity. Um, so there's lots of ways in which you can see nation building happening through these kind of trans exclusive policies. There's also some interesting stuff that people want to look into it around marriage, right? So marriage, marriage is, you know, for everybody right now, but before marriage was, before 2015, people think, oh, there's opposite sex marriage and there was same sex marriage. But like, Marriage is actually defined differently depending on what kind of law you're looking in. So in immigration law, whether you were married or not depended on the marriage law in the country you're in. So there's lots of weird stuff. And if everybody wants to look into it, I have some old memos from the about that from uh, the government um, where, where marriage is kind of used to kind of like regulate um, regulate uh, whiteness and, and participate in nation building. Excellent question. Ramsey, this is not a question from the chat, but I was just thinking about your discussion of the female replicants. Um, oh, yeah. That comes up over and over again. And one of those examples you gave was um, the female replicant as um, uh, gets gets shaped as the migrants uh, or uh, uh, women workers, migrant workers. And that's yeah. one form it takes. Um, and that's a very classed form of the female replicant. Yeah. Yes, um, and so I wonder. Uh, and you said you weren't thinking about class when you wrote your book, um, but but actually, you talk about a lot of forms that that are are deeply classed. And this doesn't just mean poor, right? So one of the things in your very first answer you gave was you talk about people in different classes or different, you know, who identify with different classes are creating differently classed forms, and um, I like the fact that you're not necessarily valuing. Uh, even I, I take the opposite stance, valuing the sort of poor class form over others. I think you put them in the uh, cultural arena and let them go. Um, but I actually do see class appear in a lot of the actual examples yeah. that you cite. You know, um, by the way, I want to acknowledge that there's like a few questions in the in the chat box that I'm so excited about too. Like I saw Smaran's question and I saw Heather's question. There's a lot of, I'm very excited. We'll get to them. Um, yeah, I mean, my view and, and this word that I'm about to use, which is so key to the study of form and formalism in in literature, is is also classed, is like I'm really interested, as Carolyn Levine says, in affordances, how like a form allows certain things to be possible and then might not be so useful for other things. So, you know, Smarin was asking me a question in the chat that's similar to yours. It's about like, what are the classed conditions of certain cultural forms in the 60s and 70s? Well, you're talking about a generation of Americans in the 50s and 60s who had the most upward mobility across all different identifications and identities of any generation before. And so the four, the cultural forms that they produced in the 60s and 70s were steeped with the values of middle class culture and middle class life. The idea of coming out as a narrative form, as like a discursive form for articulating uh, one's gayness is consistently critiqued today as like white, as middle class, as being about recognition and self-fashioning. The thing is, is even if it emerged from some of those origins, it, it had so many affordances. It could be borrowed by lots of other groups, African-Americans, Asian-Americans, you know, trans people coming out became a model for articulating a new expression of self in a queer way. So to me, like, 
e even when forms are steeped in the cl in the class that they kind of came from or emerged from, they then exceed or escape the limits of that position. And that's why what you see in the book is forms coming from so many different classed positions that are then taken up in surprising and unexpected ways by people who you would never have thought would use that, like the idea of the feminist consciousness raising circle, which could easily be critiqued as like a white middle-class feminist idea of sitting in someone's living room in a circle, right? And talking about your feelings also became an amazing way for working class queer people to articulate shared experiences in a space of equality politically. That's an amazing thing. And so I think what the research I did always kept revealing was the, the transformability of certain forms, like that they could travel so far and wide into the hands of people who never expected to be able to use them. I don't know if that's a decent answer to your question. Yeah. Um, thank you for pointing me back to the uh, Q&A. There are three questions and I'm going to read them all. Um, the first is by CLAG's board member very hardworking board member, Deborati Biswas. And Deborati says, thank you both so much for this thought provoking discussion. Both of you talked about identity politics and how identity categories such as trans or queer are often hailed to represent oppressed conditions. Do you think identity politics itself is the problem or to quote Taiwo, it, it is the elite capture of identity politics that it's the elite capture of identity politics that's the problem. That is, the way in which privileged people weaponize identity politics for the purposes of profit, such as Nike taking uh, talking about BLM and so on. Okay, so that's one question. Thank you, Debbie. Um, Smart, you asked, asked a couple. I'm going to go to the second one. Um, how do we, and this is for both, how do we account for the two sometimes contradictory understandings of class in our work in queer studies? In other words, the Marxian structural understanding of class as an economic and political category and the Berdouian understanding of class as cultural signification and distinction. The two are sometimes in contradiction. Thank you, Smarin. And the third one is for Heather, from Heather Love. Hi, Heather. Would you all want to argue that studying queer form and class and queerness requires certain methods? In other words, Ramsey, do some research. Uh, in other words... Uh, Ramsey saying, do some research and Paisley's spreadsheet. <laughs> uh, you all seem tired of the fetish of fluidity, but it's also exhaustion with certain approaches, non-empirical, a certain kind of theory. Thank you, Heather. So you can start, anyone can start anywhere. I just want to say I love these questions so much. So right, one is a, okay. Do, do you remember them or do you need a, do you need a recap? I can see them. I can see them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can see but there's one that was missed, but I can quickly mention it from um, an anonymous person. Is the government, in the government control of people's identity narratives, have you found that trans people retake their agency, those bureaucratic narratives? Yeah, like that's like a good question. And yes, often it's possible. Because what's one of the things that's really interesting about sex classification policy is like, it looks like the government is making a decision about your sex. But for people who aren't in the military, who aren't crossing, coming into the US and who aren't in prison, the government is looking what, at a piece of paper that is talking about your body and your gender identity. Your like, you know, so there's there's this mediating influence. They're not actually looking at your body, right? So there's lots of ways that agencies that agency is it gets kind of um, retaken. So a lot of the letters that doctors would write were really written by transgender rights advocates. Like here's the draft of your your letter, and like you know, mine said Paisley Cura has had all the surgery he needs, right? So a bureaucrat reads that and it's like, oh, he has all the surgery he needs. That means he's had all the surgery. Like they immediately go, right? They immediately go there, right? So like they, like there was lots of stuff like that that was um, where people were kind of having agency. There's lots of stuff. And I'm hoping someone someday will do a ethnography of this before it's too late, where trans people would would share stories about which driver's license place to go to, which clerk on which county and which day, like, um, this kind of interfaces with the street level bureaucrat kind of issue. Um, so there's lots of cool um, sharing of like ways to resist. And then the other, the other way of agency is actually like lying to the state. Like, I think that's a huge form of agency and resistance is like just saying, just like lying on documents is like, yeah, I've had this surgery. I got this document to say this. Um, the trans, some trans people would, if they were like, binary trans and had medically transitioned in some sort of way, we just go into a DMV and say, look, 
my driver's license has an F on it. That's crazy. And they'd look at the person and they'd look at the driver's license and like, oh, that's crazy. And they just change it. So there's lots of little cool ways. And this maybe we'll get to this question we'll talk about later. But we're like the empirical work that is yet to be done and hopefully it'll be done soon. Um Like shows lots of different kind of forms of resistance and agency that is that's been belied by this top down model of just harm and op oppression. Well, since you mentioned Can Heather's I, question, uh, what, oh, what yeah, methods? Sorry. Yeah, and maybe you just wanted to to say something about what methods did you look to, right? Because obviously you have methods. What so so what methods were you using and that you did not find to be exhausted? Or exhausting, and that you would want to to sort of uh, teach where you to teach that teach a queer methods class. Oh, that's such an interesting way to put the question. Can I? I want to address Heather's point directly and then respond to that. Um, you know, my thing. I, I think uh, what I'm exhausted of is not a certain method, but a certain style. I think I find that so much work in queer, feminist, trans, and critical race studies is essentially memoir at this point. People want to do a certain kind of lyrical poetry in which they combine lived experiences with certain theoretical concepts. And there's something beautiful about that. Hi, Gloria and Zaldua. It's not like that isn't a law, has not have a long history. But I think when that becomes the dominant style of articulating ideas, I, I become bored as a thinker. So what I want, it's not that I'm exhausted with any one method, it's that I want people to be using a lot more methods. I want people to actually let the object they are studying lead them to surprising and unexpected methods. I'm not an ethnographer. I don't think every book needs to have an ethnography. But when I study Tales of the City, I, I realized I needed to interview people if I wanted to be able to make a claim about the impact that this cultural object had on people's lives, right? So like, I want, I want to be surprised. Like when I read a lot of books in queer studies now, I don't feel that the people writing had been surprised by their object. I think they already had their idea already planned and they took the work of poetry or they took the novel and they forced their idea onto it. They're like, I needed this thing to conform to the image that I had of abjection or whatever. And I'm like, didn't the object surprise you? Like when I put the Stepford Wives with the female man, with the woman warrior, I never in a million years thought those three went together. I was reading tons of feminist writing from the 70s. And I was like, these are the same book written by three different people. Sula is the fourth. I just didn't include it in the chapter. They're all the same book written by different identity positions. And that helped me reveal something that I think was unexpected. So what I want is for people to be more creative and expansive with the methods they deploy. I want to see close reading, surface reading, ethnography, history and, history, like I want, and historiography. I want people to be intelligently knitting together different methodological um, uh, style, uh, what is it, methodological models in order to reveal something about the world that we didn't know before. And that requires you to be inventive and creative, not transplant an existing theoretical concept, model, or framework onto every single thing that you study, which is why I find a lot of people write the same book over and over and over again. And I'm there, like, when I look at Matt's work, I just think it's so interesting that Matt, you like went completely different from your first book, right? Like new questions arose and you moved in a new direction. I'm excited to see thinkers that I admire write books about different things. Heather, you did the same thing. Like you went in a completely different direction in your second book, whether people disagree or agree with the arguments, you've opened up a new set of questions by moving in a new direction and, and taking in new methods. And so that's what I want to see. And maybe that's my bias as an American studies scholar, that I was trained in such a richly interdisciplinary way. There was no way that I could land on only theory or only culture or only history or only politics. I had to do all of them all at once. Let me point us to Debbie's question. And this was the question about, is it identity politics itself the problem? Um, or has there been an elite capture of identity politics? And is that the problem? Um, and so in other words, the privileged people weaponize, identity, privileged people weaponize identity politics for the purpose of profit. Well, I'm happy to jump in there because I think this discussion is sort of kind of melding together now. Um, but just to kind of... Um, repeat a little bit or rehearse a little bit what Ramsey said about methods like for me it is 
Like I, I went into this project kind of thinking I'm the transgender rights advocate. I also have a scholarly job, but I'm going to look at how transgender people are harmed. And then like, I only started to figure things out when I just dropped that project. And I said, I'm going to look at, you know, these, I'm actually going to look at these forms and I'm going to like, not under, I'm going to drop the idea about what sex and gender is. And I'm going to just say sex is whatever the government says it is. That's the thing I hold, hold steady. And I'm going to go back and figure out why that happens. So, um, but I do think, I mean, I love Taylor's book. I love it. It's great. It's a great book. So I think what he talks about is definitely true. Um, but I also think it's, and I think we, I think we can't get rid of identity politics because we need it. And this kind of gets back, gets to Sam, Sam Smarin's point too about like, do we have classes in Marx or classes in Bordeaux? Like we can't like change how we change the world without a little bit of Bordeaux in there because we can't just drop into like the union movement without a little bit of um bringing together of different ways of accommodating difference in those spaces, you know, as, as people have been doing. So it's not just, uh, we can't, we can't just say, oh, we're going to drop any mention of identity and no one has to worry about respecting difference. Um, but just getting back to a little bit um, about the identity Paul, or about, about methods. I think even in the interdis interdisciplinary areas, like American studies or queer studies or gender studies, I think identity politics sort of becomes its disciplinarity and it becomes its canonical rule. And I think sometimes with this kind of, you get a facile version of that, which is kind of what I think Janet Haley calls convergentism. And it it, it gets in the way of people's thought, right? Because you're like, I am anti-racist. I am pro-trans. I am this. And so you, there's no way to imagine like, like, um, a racist transgender person or an um, uh, or a, a community of color that is transphobic like there's all and so like we see that we see this all the time in in politics like i i live in a black neighborhood and all my white friends were like i can't believe it they eric eric adams was 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 voted in it's like people <laughs> black people are concerned about crime and your your analytical frame doesn't allow you to see that because you can talk about the Carlson complex from Park Slope and you, but you, you don't understand like how people kind of live their lives in a much more complex way. So just getting back to the kind of questions about, about method, there's just, there's just so much tidiness that is imposed, kind of what Ramsey was saying from the beginning that we don't allow ourselves to be surprised or, and we have these kind of preordained um, conclusions. So I'll stop there for a minute. I am so galvanized by that. And I have to say, this question is so near and dear to my heart. If you've read any of my recent work, like all my work is now a critique of identitarianism, <laughs> like a really, really aggressive critique. So uh, identity politics is a political strategy. That's it. It is an absolutely necessary political strategy to all politics, left, right, or center. You cannot bring disparate heterogeneous people together to accomplish anything in the universe if they do not have a sense of shared something you fill in the blank whatever identity is one shared logic by which people can come together to affect change in the world at its simplest it's necessary it is not the whole of politics it's just one strategy among many it has had to it has now gained so much weight that's the problem that it has transformed from being a political strategy into being a religion so i often say in my work i am not critiquing identity politics i'm critiquing identitarianism the transformation of identity politics into a kind of orthodoxy about the self and its relationship to the political world the ascendancy of the category of identity of self making of self production to the core of freedom for gender, sexual, and other kinds of marginalized people, I think is a nightmare. I think it's become a disaster. The explosion of mental health crisis, of, of, of like constant pain and struggle and negativity around identity is both a product of oppressive systems, but also because of our obsessive focus on identity as the source of our meaning and our self. It's no wonder that millions of people are turning to psychedelics, which are drugs that force the psychological release of the ego, because people are fucking exhausted of themselves and of having to constantly confront and deal with themselves. So a lot of what I talk about in queer forms is the irony of how the more and more that we've turned to fluidity as a logic of gender and sexual freedom, the less and less capable this generation is of dealing with being misrecognized. 
that like every time that somebody doesn't uh, recognize you the way you want to, you want them to, you uh, like unravel. That to me is not fluidity. That is about clinging so dearly to certain identity categories. So where we see that in the interdisciplines is the fact that even to this day, after 40 plus years of identity study, we still think race, class, gender, sexuality, ability are like the categories, as opposed to mood, temperament, affect, um, religious and spiritual worldview, sensory capacity. I remind people, I'm like, my number one identity in the world is that I'm an intellectual. That's number one. My number two is that I'm an intense person. That distinguishes <laughs> me from so many people. It's something I'm constantly navigating. People love it and then they hate it. Then they're dazzled by it. Then I think of myself as queer. Then I think of myself as Arab American. Then maybe I'm a gay guy. Like I, these things are always shifting and changing and most of them are affective. And our inability to understand, this goes back to your question about complexity, right? To understand that identity is just one category for understanding one's lived relation to the world is really getting in the way of us learning about how people live. Because I remind my students all the time that 90% of what they do in the world has nothing to do with their identities. It's just about like living and functioning and moving. I'm like, when you're going to the bathroom, are you worried about your identity or like just engaging in a bodily function? You'd have to ask yourself that and not assume it in advance. So to me, the problem is not so much identity politics. It is the ascendancy of identity as a category of understanding it needs to be put back in its place. It's one part of being a person, but m a much smaller part than we give it credit for. And there have to be other ways of understanding our relation to the planet. And I, I think it is it is really becoming an effective nightmare, especially for people on the left. Um, there's a comment in the Q&A. This is not a question, but uh, someone, uh, Edney Garrison says, Ramsey is my spiritual twin. So you have a spiritual <laughs> twin out there, Ramsey. I'm here for you. Uh, I'm with you. <laughs> Um, Can I say one quick thing? I know I've been talking a lot. I just, please. you know, I want to go back to Heather's question real quick. Heather, now that I think about it, I do believe if there's one method that you have to have to be able to study these things, you do need to be sort of a formalist. And I don't mean that in the old school literary studies for, way of like, you have to be a, like, a, you know, a new critic. I think I agree with Ellen Rooney, the, the feminist literary critic. There is no such thing as the study of culture without the study of form, because everything in the universe is ultimately a form. Like everything that comes to you can be cognized because you give it a shape. If I say, what does a black hole look like? We actually don't know what black holes look like, but most of you probably thought of a funnel, right? Like most of you could give it a shape in your mind. If you have no theory of form, it doesn't need to come from lit studies. It could come from art history, from political theory. If you have no conception of shaping or of how to study the way things come to be organized and received, I don't think you can actually produce anything. And I think one of the big like problems in contemporary queer uh, and interdisciplinary study is that a lot of people who are studying cultural objects don't actually have a theory of form. They're just talking about those objects as, as carrying political messages that they like or that they're interested in. But most people actually can't tell you how a form is working. So like, I think about David Getze's work in Abstract Bodies, that is like a rigorously formalist book that is like, let me show you how the shape of certain art forms transmit ideas about trans existence. Whether you hate that book's argument or not is beside the point because it so rigorously engages with the idea of giving shape to something and it has a theory of form. And so if there's one method I think you have to kind of have, it's you have to have your own theory of form. Uh, I invite people to continue to put questions in the chat. Um, one by an anonymous attendee, um, Ramsey, I am dazzled. I'm going to look for all of your <laughs> so work sweet. now. Paisley, so I'm fascinated sweet. with... <laughs> I am fascinated with your book and its use of a collected archive of laws and statutes. So methodologically inspiring. Uh, I've always been interested in how bureaucracy can be toxic, but how we can subvert it. Thanks to both. Amazing. Thank you. Um, Heather says, yes, I basically agree, but the idea, uh, sorry, I just lost that. Um, let me take no, this I, opportunity. I, yeah. 
do you do you still see it? I, I, that question. Yeah, I just wanted, I totally agree with Heather. Heather was saying I agree, but also when you make everything into a forum, then nothing is a forum. And I agree that's true of everything, right? If you say everything is political, then then nothing is political. I guess my view is both things can be true. Everything can be a form, but you have to show somebody how it became that. Everything can become political, but you have to show how it got articulated to the public sphere. That's Linda Zerilli's argument. She's like, everything can become political if you articulate it as a question of public concern. And my thing is that I would love to see people make surprising and unexpected arguments. How about things that we didn't think were form can appear as form in certain contexts. Um, and so that, that allows you to think about it as capacious, but also not everything all the time, et cetera. Um. We are going to, to wrap up in just a minute, but I have a little bit of work to do. Uh, sometimes, or most often at the beginning of our events, um, CLAGS asks for your support. And um, I actually think it's more convincing to ask for your support at the end, because first of all, if you stuck around, <laughs> but also if you got to listen to these wonderful panelists, Ramsey and Paisley, I can't thank you enough um, for giving your time uh, to us today, uh, for, for being supporters of CLAGS with your time and your work. Um, CLAGS, of course, is at CUNY, and so we're talking about class today, and, and we're also talking about a sort of push against rigidity or singularity or coherence. Um, and so one of the things CLAGS wants to do, we're very, very proud of our CUNY identity. We're very proud that we're at CUNY, the the largest public urban university in the nation and that our students are 80% people of color and mostly working class and poor. We, we're incredibly proud of that. However, we also are an outward looking national and international organization. And so we're always looking to cross class lines. We're always looking to cross the urban rural divide. We're trying to figure out ways to do cross institutional cross-class collaborations. Um, and this, I think, works against the idea that everything can only be one thing or happen in one place, or it has to be, we all have to agree. Um, I wrote a book, Poor Queer Studies, about my experience learning how to teach queer studies to poor students at the College of Staten Island. Uh, and it's a very located study that I think others disagree with, given where they are located. I want to to talk to you and to, to, and, to, and uh, now that I'm uh, ED of CLAGS, to, to have a relationship with people who have different experiences than mine. And so I, I say this by, by way of saying, um, asking your, for your support in a couple of ways, um, asking for your support in terms of thinking of ways that you, wherever you are in your located place, can collaborate with CLAGS um, as an, on an institutional or organizational level. Um, but also at an individual level. And on that level, one of the things you can do to collaborate with us is to go to clags.org and donate to us. Um, we are, are funding at a, a poor, uh, Paisley, you could talk about this, at a poor <laughs> urban uh, public university is pretty dismal. We're expected to be self-funded at CLAGS and we have a very, 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 very lean staff. Um, and so a lot of the donations that we uh, receive, just go to pay our, our basically one staff person. Um, so we can use your help and, and we appreciate it, uh, whether you give a little or a lot. Um, but also, I, I, I don't just want to say that money is, is money, but I think it's a, a contribution to the kind of crossing over um, that we're interested in and that, frankly, we need to do and that makes everything more lively. Uh, and I think this harkens back to both Paisley and Ramsey's work about how things are multiple and contradictory and messy. And I think we want to be as messy as we can get at, <laughs> at CLAGS. And so we invite your, your support um, and, and your difference uh, into queer studies. I particularly want to say that to people working and teaching and who went to community colleges and to colleges in the South and to, um, to rural colleges. Um, it's those perspectives, I think, that, that often are unseen in queer studies in the profession, and I want to invite those uh, into the discussion. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. Uh, you can go to clags.org and click donate. I just want to say that one more time in case I didn't. Ramsey, Paisley, um, thank you for... Uh, Thank you for this great discussion. Um, for everybody and for you two, it will live online at CLAG's YouTube channel. Um, and so just go to YouTube and search for CLAG's. 
hopefully this could be a great pedagogical tool for all the teachers out there. Um, you can show it in your classes uh, and to, to see what one, um, what one small strain of queer studies is, is thinking about right now in terms of queer and class relations. Ramsey Paisley, do you want to say anything else? Uh, well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. It was a delight to hear from, from you both. And um, I also do miss the early days of the virus epidemic when everybody would just be there and you could see everybody's face and talk and no one knew, knew how to use Zoom. And um, I mean, I understand why we have these webinars, but um, I, it's nice to see people I know and the participants and uh, have some sense of uh, community. Uh, I just want to say, I, this is what I live for. I love having these conversations. Uh, for everybody in the audience, thank you so much for taking part of your part of your day to join us. I am always happy to chat with people more online, over Zoom. I'm on sabbatical. I take breaks. And just two quick things, if I could just advertise. I am going to be uh, the new lead editor of Post Millennial Pop at NYU Press, which has been beautifully edited, like run by Henry Jenkins and uh, Karen Thompson, and uh, I mean, we shouldn't even be advertising it that soon because we're still putting together a team, but I hope that people doing really cutting edge, interesting work in popular culture will submit their manuscripts. And I'm also a new columnist for Film Quarterly. And so every few months I'm gonna be producing work of cultural criticism. And the first piece is gonna be about playing The Last of Us to the video game. Um, uh, so I, I'm excited to write about video games from a kind of political theory perspective, and that'll come out this summer. Thank you, Ramsey. Thank you, Paisley. Thanks also to Rob Hurley, our uh, event text fellow, and to our ASL interpreters, Carls and Mark. Um, thanks, James Harris, the board co-chair of CLAGS. And um, I just want to say Laura Westengard's name, our other board co-chairs. These are the hardest working people uh, at CUNY, I am convinced. James and Laura, thank you so much. Rod, thanks. Ramsey and Paisley, thank you so much. Everybody have a good night. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.